In this video, I'm going to talk about something that is usually very well covered in uh, electromagnetics courses and electrical engineering departments, but it's often covered with a very, in a very mathematical way, and this is the subject of transmission lines. I'm going to try here in this video, or two videos, however much it comes out to be, to try to develop some more intuitive understanding of what's going on in a transmission line and why they are important. Up here I've drawn a standard circuit, and this is a circuit that you would learn in your basic circuits class, you may even learn it in high school, where we have a 5 volt source out here, just a DC source, and then we have a load resistor down here. And the standard way of looking at the circuit is just simple V equals I R, where you have this, this circulating current um, passing through the load, and then uh, the return current coming back to the source. And how, before I go on to transmission lines, how, how would this look in a, in a coaxial cable? Let me pause and draw that. This is how it would look in a coaxial cable where you have the, uh, the center conductor, the core coming down the middle, uh, passing to the load resistance, and maybe you have it shorted to the shield up here. Now, these models, they're pretty good, and they're going to work for low frequency, DC, maybe up to a few hundred, mega, a few hundred kilohertz, or maybe even in the megahertz. But something you need to realize is that this is never, ever a fully accurate model. It's never an accurate, a fully accurate representation of what's actually going on in the circuit. To get a full, fully accurate representation, you actually have to go to Maxwell's equations, uh, which becomes very cumbersome to solve. So we're not going to go to that step. So the, the solution is an intermediate step of transmission lines. I'm going to pause and draw a uh, transmission line system based on a source and load. Here we have a, a source and a load, and let's imagine in between those two, so this would be the source and this would be the load, and here I've drawn it in more abstract form. Uh, imagine between the source and the load there are many, many, many individual segments of wire, in fact an infinite number of segments of wire. And each segment of wire has uh, some reactive or DC components associated with it, and so what will they be? You'll have a per unit length inductance, L, you'll have a per unit length resistance, R. You'll have a capacitance between the conductor at the top and the return conductor at the bottom, C. And I, I messed this up a little bit, but we're also going to have a, a resistance, an effective resistance between the top and bottom, and we're going to label that as 1 over G, 1 over the conductance, and that's a leakage resistance between these, these two wires. And this is one unit of those infinitesimally small um, segments that that are that are close that are between the source and the load and so I'm going to draw a dotted line and then another inductor here to complete the circuit the dotted line represents it's going there's an infinite number of them potentially and the resistance here it's a little messy but anyways uh, here let me write it out different segments we have inductance per unit length which is Henry's per meter a resistance per unit length, which is ohms per meter, uh, capacitance, which is farads per meter, and if I scroll down and write conductance per unit length, which is Siemens per meter. Something I want to point out is that all wires, uh, any wire, will have this per unit length inductance, and it will probably be self-inductance. We'll also have per unit length resistance, this R, and this resistance is in fact what you'll measure for the resistance of the line um, and in, in the DC state, and so when you see ohms per meter, or ohms per meter squared, or whatever, it's going to be related to this resistance. The conduct, the, the capacitance. Uh, if the wires are tightly coupled, this will be the capacitance between the wires. If they're distant from one another, maybe it's the free space capacitance. And the same kind of goes for the conductance here. Uh, if they're close together, you might have a leakage. But these are present in all wires, every, every wire. And thus, every wire is a transmission line. Now let me scroll down and redraw things a little bit. Four different cases of the, the transmission line. I scroll down. I'm going to draw four models. We have the general model, the general transmission line model, the model per unit length, and that's exactly what I drew up above. So that's that's this guy here. We have the, the inductor, the conductance, the capacitor, and the resistance. Now let's look at the DC model, where you're waiting in a certain state for a very long time, and so we know the impedance of J omega L at when omega is zero 
is going to be 0, and the impedance of 1 over j omega c is going to be infinity for omega equals 0, or 2 pi f equals 0. And what does the transmission line look like in that case? Well, the only two elements left are the conductance and the resistance. Now let's look at the, another version of this where we're taking these assumptions and adding assumptions to it. Let's assume that the resistance of the line is very, very, very low, very low, which is usually the case. And so R is much, much less than, let's just arbitrarily say, 1 ohm. And the, uh, the conductance is, is very low. The impedance between the, the two conductors is very high. So 1 over G is much, much greater than 1 ohm. And what do we have there? We just have two lines. So this is the standard that you learn in your general circuits class. But as I mentioned, this or this is not going to be very good for uh, analyzing real systems uh, that are operating above a certain frequency. Uh, the frequency that matters is, it depends on your application. Um, but what we can say is that there's a model that's actually pretty close to what we need. And it is this model here while removing these two elements. The, these are the, the elements that will create heating, that will create power, dual heating, um, and energy will be sunk in these resistors. So we're going to assume that our transmission line is lossless. And that's just going to be the inductor and the capacitor. And we know this is a fiction because I already, we, we know for sure that these other two elements exist, so why would we do it this way? Well, the reason we do it this way is that it's much, much easier to solve the equations governing a transmission line system using a lossless model. And it's a pretty accurate model, too, because we can say J omega L, um, as you go up in frequency, is going to be a lot greater than the resistance. It's going to be greater than the 1 ohm or whatever is associated with this uh, resistor here. And the, the leakage, well, the, the capacitance will, will likewise be associated with this this uh, element here. And so this is a pretty good model. I'm going to scroll down and walk through a thought experiment. Here I've drawn a transmission line system where we have the 5 volt DC supply from before and a resistive load at the end. And I've included three elements of the lossless transmission line along the way. At time zero, we're going to shut this switch and let this 5 volts propagate down the line towards the, the load. And it's not going to reach there instantly. Uh, your intuition should probably tell you that there's going to be some time associated with the information that's here reaching down here. And nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, so that's the speed at which it travels. Um, and then along the way, we have some points here. We have point A, we have point B, and then this is the, the point at the load. When we close the switch, the line will begin to charge up to 5 volts, and this point will charge up a little faster than this point, than this point. They'll all sort of come up at the same time, but point A is going to reach 5 volts before point B, before the load. Uh, the energy is traveling from the source towards the load, and why does it take some time? Well, part of the reason is that it needs to energize the magnetic field around the uh, uh, inductor, the, the, per, the, the inductance per unit length, and it needs to energize the electric field inside the capacitor. Um, and this takes time. Until the wave propagates all the, or until the signal propagates all the way down to the load, the source only sees, the source sees, and I'm putting that in quotes, uh, it sees only the characteristic impedance of the line, which is defined by the inductance and the capacitance. And so Z, the characteristic impedance, usually written as Z naught, equals L over C. And I can rarely remember whether this is L over C or C over L. One way you can think about it is that the impedance would go up as, um, well, Z L equals, one, equals J omega L. So as a, the um, impedance of the capacitor, uh, the, the inductor goes up, you would expect the characteristic impedance of the line to go up, and that's true. This is in the numerator, and then in the denominator, you have Z sub C equals 1 over J omega C. And you can think about this. This part resists current, and this part accepts current. That's kind of a hokey way of describing it, but it can help you remember whether it should be, that it should be L over C. And this, this characteristic impedance depends on geometry and the materials of the dielectric in between the two conductors. Sometimes that'll be air, 
more often than not, it'll be some sort of uh, dielectric material like Teflon, or if you're or FR4 if you're on a printed circuit board, or if you're in silicon, it'll be maybe the silicon dioxide. But there will be a dielectric, and that and the dielectric constant, and the geometry, geometry, oh, uh, tree will determine Z0. Now, the way to think about this is not in terms of 5 volts flowing down the line. You, you should think about it in terms of a traveling electromagnetic wave. And at any point along the, the transmission line, the voltage seen at any point, like point A, is going to be equal to the current times the characteristic impedance. Um, and this, this propagation of the signal down, down the, the conductor pair will happen at the speed of light in the dielectric. And let's say we're dealing with Teflon. And we know that the speed of light is uh, equal to 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second uh, in a vacuum. More generally, that's a V naught. More generally, the speed of light is equal to 1 over the dielectric constant times the permeability, which is equal to 1 over LC, which is equal to about 0.7C uh, for Teflon. For Teflon where this is C, the speed of light in a vacuum. That's that guy. Let me say three things about this transmission line before I stop and go on to the next video. At different points along the transmission line, we can have different potentials at the same time. So simultaneously, point A and point B could be at different potentials. And this is very different, of course, from your standard circuit model um, that you learn in intro, the very most introductory classes. Um, but it is true that it's going to take time for that signal to propagate down the line. Uh, traveling signals will charge and discharge the inductor and capacitor, energize and de-energize the inductors and capacitors per unit length as it travels down the line, and that becomes more and more important as this goes from 5 volts to, a, to an AC signal of some kind. Uh, and lastly, potentials in the system depend not just on what the source and the load impedances, the source uh, voltage and the load and pieces. It, it, it depends very much so on these per unit length elements along the way.